People like Jill Stein do not only represent a political challenge to the entrenched elites of Republicans and Democrats, but also a social challenge to capitalism and imperialism that is embodied by the movements which support them. It is in this spirit of left solidarity and optimism for the future that I would like to introduce to you Green Party 2016 presidential candidate, Dr. Jill Stein. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rutgers. Thank you, New Jersey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Don, for that very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And thank you, Rutgers, for doing the amazing work that you're doing, standing up against sweatshops, standing up for your faculty and their right to decent wages and job security. Uh, thank you for standing up against Condoleezza Rice as a, as, a, uh, con as a commencement speaker. Thank you for standing up on all those counts. And this really is a time to stand up. And as, as Don was saying, this is a time for us to come together across historic divisions because we really have an unprecedented crisis, a crisis of our economy, of our ecology, of peace and democracy and civil liberties and you name it. Uh, all of this is very much imperiled right now. There's a wonderful example of how we are coming together as a people right now. Up in North Dakota, where the Standing Rock Sioux are coming together with 200 indigenous tribes overcoming their historic divisions in order to come together for the humanity and for Mother Earth, which is all imperiled and really requires us to stand up right now as one people for one planet. And I want to give a thank you to Standing Rock. <laughs> for leading the way and you know in Standing Rock there's a crisis of human rights for the indigenous people for the desecration of their sacred sites there is a uh, crisis of water they're standing up not only for their own water but for 17 million people downstream in the Missouri River that will all be put at risk by the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, they are standing up for the climate that we all share. The climate cannot afford one more pipeline, not one more, we need to stop them all. And their courageous example of standing up uh, was really incredible and I felt I didn't go there to actually participate in civil disobedience, but when they said to me, you know, would I lock down? I was not interested in locking down, to tell you the truth. It's a dangerous thing to do, and you can be badly injured and beat up. But then when they came to me and said, well, would you help lift up our message by inscribing something on the blade of this piece of not construction equipment, but a piece of destruction equipment that was being used to put water and climate and human rights and sacred sites uh, at risk and to desecrate them, there was no way that I could conscience not standing up to help them. So I said, I approve your message. And, and I think the, um, the police made a mistake. They issued a warrant for the arrest of the wrong party because I was not uh, the vandal here. The real vandal is the Dakota Access Pipeline Company, which is vandalizing our planet. And I must say, I felt very vindicated when the president two days later said, yes, indeed, you have to stop this right now, and we need to go back to the drawing boards. So this is the kind of courage and the kind of unity that we need right now to come together. And in fact, when I was there, I learned that there are uh, native legends, including a legend foretold by Black Elk, that seven generation hence, that the earth would be sick and dying and that the native people would come together and lead us forward uh, in unity to uh, save Mother Earth and humanity. And you know, it's kind of an eerie thing, but that is kind of what seems to be happening right now. 
And I think there could be no better example for us to follow than to be standing up for our human rights, for our water, and for our climate. And that is very much the job, I think, that we have right now and the challenge that we have in this election. Because as uh, Frederick Douglass says, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. We must be that demand, and that demand was, must take place not only in our workplaces, not only in our schools, not only at the fracking sites. Uh, that demand must also take place in the voting booth. If we do not challenge power, then all the other work that we do will be basically bypassed and will count for nothing if we are not also challenging power. So I applaud everyone out there who is a part of challenging power. And let me just ask, how many are here that have connected with the Green Party in any way? A few, all right, quite a few. Wow, that is really exciting to see. And how many are here that came through the Bernie campaign? And that is exciting to see. And how many are just here as students that are getting mobilized and fighting the ba battles that are in front of us? And I, you know, I have to applaud you all for standing up. Uh, yesterday we got the news that the uh, Clinton campaign is launching an assault on people who dare to think independently, on people who actually dare to recognize what's going on, that the biggest wasted vote, in fact, is to vote for more of what is throwing us under the bus. Because this lesser, lesser evil thing is not working out so good for us. And I think it's our job to stand up you know, to stand up and actually do a reality check on what's going on here. Because this politics of fear delivered everything we were afraid of. When they say that you've got to vote your fears and not your values, you know, they are trying to intimidate us out of voting for ourselves, voting on our own behalf. So we've been told you have to vote for the lesser evil because you didn't want the expanding wars, you didn't want the meltdown of the climate, you didn't want the offshoring of our jobs or the massive bailouts for Wall Street or the assault on immigrants or the expanding prison industrial complex or the incredible debt that a generation has been locked into. But all those things that we were supposed to be voting for the lesser evil in order to avoid, that's exactly what we've gotten by allowing ourselves to be silenced. So what we say is that it's time to forget this propaganda of the lesser evil. In fact, the lesser evil just paves the way to the greater evil because people stop coming out to vote for it. Uh, because a lesser evil politician throwing you under the bus is not what you come out and vote for. So after electing a lesser evil president, we lost, you know, both houses of Congress flipped from being blue to being red, not because these were Republican victories, but these were losses of Democrats, because the Democratic base would not come out to vote for politicians throwing them under the bus. So we say it's time to forget the lesser evil, to stand up and fight for the greater good like our lives depend on it, because in fact they do. So, you know, when we start to hear from Hillary Clinton's surrogates uh, about why we have to be good little boys and girls and follow our marching orders from the political operatives and the uh, media pundits who are all telling us to just keep vote, voting for what's throwing us under the bus, you know, uh, we say just, just forget that because the majority of American voters now have rejected both of the major party candidates. They are the most disliked and most untrusted presidential candidates in our history. So why are these guys telling us that we have to keep voting for them when they don't have our votes to start with? We're not stealing those votes. There's no new entitlement for 
big rich politicians and their powerful establishment parties, they're acting like they're entitled to our votes. They have to earn our votes. They don't own our votes and they don't have our votes. They are the most rejected <laughs> candidates ever. <clears throat> In fact, the majority of Hillary's supporters, this came out last week in the Quinnipiac poll, if you want to check it. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Water would be really cool about now. <coughs> Thank you. Um, but what that poll showed, in fact, was that the majority of Hillary's supporters, thank you so much, the majority of Hillary's supporters actually don't really like Hillary. They mostly are terrified of Donald Trump. But guess what? The majority of Donald Trump supporters, it's the same thing. They're mostly just really terrified by Hillary Clinton. So why don't we give them somebody else that they could actually vote for instead of having to vote against? <laughs> Because democracy is not just a question of who do we hate the most and who do we fear the most. Democracy needs an affirmative agenda. It's got to be about what we're for. And it needs a moral compass, you could say, because if we bury our values, we leave a moral vacuum that gets filled by the predatory politicians that are doing the bidding of the predatory banks and the Wall Street profiteers and the fossil fuel giants and the warmongers. So that's not our business, that's their business. And we know not only from looking around, but we also know from these studies like out of Northwestern and Princeton done a couple of years ago that showed there's about a zero relationship between what everyday people want and what actually gets done in Washington, D.C. So we're saying it's time to throw the bums out, it's time to stand up for what we deserve, and by the way, they could fix this voting system anytime they want and create ranked choice voting, which gets rid of the fear, it lets you actually rank your choices, you could put your first choice an underdog number one if you want, and your safety choice is number two, and it ensures that your vote will be reassigned from your first choice to your second choice if that candidate loses. So it's a win-win. The first time I actually ran for office running against Mitt Romney for governor in Massachusetts way back in uh, 2002, thank you, uh, we actually proposed that bill in the Democratic legislature so that they could avoid any splitting of the vote, any unintended consequence by having a third party candidate run, they could have fixed it, but they didn't. Even 16 years later, they won't let that bill out of committee, which tells you something. They rely on fear. They want you to be intimidated into voting for them. And why do they do that? Because they know that they don't have real reasons positive reasons for you to vote for them, which tells you they are not on our side. That alone is enough reason to lose them your vote. They do not deserve your vote if they are unable to actually fix the voting system to liberate our votes. It's time to stand up against that kind of intimidation. So I'm going to just run through a couple of quick uh, solutions because I know we're going to have we're going to go to questions real soon, but I want you to know more than anything to reject this. A propaganda of powerlessness. We are not powerless, we are powerful. And here's one way that we are powerful. If you just look at the number of young people and some who are not so young, who are locked into student loan debt, that is 43 million people. That is enough to win a three-way presidential race. So we actually have the power simply by letting people know that we can bail out the students. It's about time we bailed out the crooks on Wall Street. Would you say it's about time to bail out their victims, the young people? So 
Bailing out Wall Street cost us about $16 trillion, all right? And we came up with it like that in order to save their necks. Well, to bail out young people is about $1.3 trillion. This is the most powerful stimulus package you can imagine because it's people who have the training, they have the skills, they have the degrees, but they're working two and three part-time low-wage jobs because that's the economy that we got after Wall Street crashed it through their waste, fraud, and abuse. Some jobs have come back, but those are low-wage, part-time, temporary, and insecure jobs. So people are not paying back these loans. As you, as you have probably noticed, that number keeps getting bigger, the number of people who are locked into student loan debt. So we're saying this is the right thing to do, not just for young people, but for all of us, because this is how we create the economy of the future by turning loose this generation that is ready to re vision and recreate the just, sustainable, green economy of the future. This is what you deserve and all of us need. So just by telling your friends, uh, does anybody know anybody out there who's in student loan debt? I think there are probably a few right here. Just by letting your friends know. Uh, friends don't let friends stay home in student debt, come out and vote green in 2016, and put an end to that debt. In coming out to do that, we have the numbers to take over this election. When they tell us, oh, but you're doing so bad in the polls, I'd say to the contrary. We're actually doing really good in the polls, considering that we have not hardly gotten a dime worth of primetime media. Donald Trump has gotten $4 billion worth. Hillary Clinton has gotten over $2 billion worth. We've hardly had any, but we're not that far behind. Trump has had 35,000 times as much free media as we have. Hillary Clinton has 20,000 times as much, but they're not doing 35,000 times better. They're doing maybe 10 times better, but we would be doing a whole lot better because there are people out there who are dying literally and figuratively for the kinds of things that we are bringing to the table. And that's not only ending student debt, it's making public higher education free and making private higher education affordable and debt free. It's creating, it's creating an emergency jobs program a Green New Deal, like the New Deal that got us out of the Great Depression, but in this case, it's green, so it not only fixes this crisis of our stagnant and declining economy, but it also fixes the crisis of this climate catastrophe that's barreling down on us. So it fixes them both at once, by doing what we did during the New Deal. This is not rocket science. Donald Trump says he's gonna create 25 million jobs, but he doesn't have a clue how he's gonna do it. More smoke and mirrors. We're gonna do it the way it's been done before, by funding it, by directly funding job creation, not through tax breaks, not through benefits for big multinational corporations, but actually by funding at the local level. National funding, but local control through a participatory and democratic process of one person, one vote, not one dollar, one vote, so that communities decide what kinds of jobs they need. And they can create worker cooperatives, they can create nonprofits, they can create small businesses, so that we have a mixed and small community based economy that is creating jobs in clean renewable energy, in weatherization, in uh, insulation in efficiency, in healthy, local, organic food production. So we have a food system which is good for us and the planet. And creating jobs in public transportation. And that includes safe sidewalks and bike paths. So we have a right to recreational transportation as well as to high quality, affordable, public transportation. And just 
very quickly so you know when they say to you, oh, but we could never afford that. Actually, it turns out, and I can tell you this as a medical doctor, we get so much healthier by getting rid of fossil fuels that the savings in our health care system, which is really a sick care system, because what it does is patch us up after corporations have made us sick through their pollution and their bad food system and all that, uh, we save so much money through this healthy food and healthy energy system and healthy transit system, we save so much on our health that the savings in health care alone are actually enough to pay the costs of the green energy transition. Not only that, but this Green New Deal revives the economy, turns the tide on climate change, restores our health, and it makes the friggin' wars for oil obsolete. This bloated and dangerous military budget, which is sort of the flip side of this, is not making us safer. We are not safer for all the wars that we have fought. We're now bombing seven countries. Uh, and where have we gotten with this? It's cost us $6 trillion, according to a recent Harvard study, just for Iraq and Afghanistan alone when you include the cost of caring for our wounded veterans. And our wounded veterans need much better care, as a matter of fact, better health care and better housing, better mental health and drug rehab. And they need a job, by the way, a job and job training, and they would get that job under the Green New Deal. Uh, but to pay for the costs of their health and the other costs of war um, is $6 trillion, which comes to $50,000 for every household in America. Is this what you wanted to spend your $50,000 on? I don't think so. How about, how about education? How about health care? How about a place to live? You know, the American people are goaded into this. We've been hoodwinked into this because because it's all being swept under the rug. And by the way, that's why we need to be in the debates. Not just outside of the debates, we need to be in the debates. Because this kind of outrage cannot stand up to the light of day. When people actually learn, oh my God, it's costing me $50,000 for just those two wars, that it's costing more than half of our discretionary budget, it's costing about half of your income taxes to pay for these wars. And what have we achieved? Failed states, mass refugee migrations, which are tearing apart the Middle East and Europe, not to mention, and which are creating worse terrorist threats. Because where did ISIS come from? The chaos of Iraq and Libya. And where did Al-Qaeda come from? Well, we trained them, right? Remember, we were training Osama bin Laden back in Afghanistan as part of trying to trip up the Soviet Union. You know, and, and our policy of working with any, um, uh, any, uh, any warmonger out there uh, is basically what we do. You know, if you're on our side today, that's great. We'll arm you, we'll train you, because that's good for our weapons industry. And, you know, if you move on to some other terrorist cause tomorrow, well, you know, well, that's too bad. We just get to sell more weapons. So the only ones who are making out like bandits here is the war profiteering industry. Middle East is not benefiting, democracy is not benefiting, we don't have more stable countries, we, do not, we are not advancing the rights of women or religious freedom, uh, we are not more secure in this country, these wars are blowing back at us. It's time for us to stand up. We need a new kind of offensive in the Middle East. We call it a peace offensive in the Middle East. It, because we cannot simultaneously fight terrorism with one hand while with the other hand we and our allies are funding terrorism, arming terrorism, and training terrorism. Hillary Clinton herself identified the Saudis as still, long after 9-11, still the Saudis are the major funder of Sunni uh, jihad enterprises around the world. So we need to get serious and say to our uh, to our allies that we're turning over a new leaf. Of course, we need to say this with all humility because it's us as much as anybody who's been on the wrong side of the fence here. 
but we need to be turning over a new leaf and actually imposing a weapons embargo on the Middle East, which is not so hard to do because we're supplying the majority of weapons actually to all sides through our allies uh, and ourselves. So a weapons embargo and a freeze on the bank accounts of those countries that continue to fund terrorist enterprises uh, and also to uh, instruct our allies, Turkey, to close their border. They closed it to the movement of refugees. It's about, unfortunately, it's time to close it to the movement of jihadi militias so that they are not flowing into uh, Syria to, uh, you know, to add fuel to the fire. But above all, we need to stop applying a flamethrower to the Middle East by promoting the sale of weapons to all parties. And that includes the Saudis, to whom we have sold over $100 billion worth of weapons over the last eight years. So it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science how to fix this. Uh, I'll just mention quickly, we need also a welcoming path to citizenship for the immigrants who've always been at the backbone of our economies and our communities. The most powerful thing we can do to fix the immigration crisis is to stop causing it in the first place through NAFTA, through the war on drugs, and by overturning democracies. So it's not rocket science how to deal with this, uh, the crisis of immigration. Um, we need to create health care as a human right through Medicare for all. It's long overdue. And we need, it's time to put an end to police violence and this uh, uh, epidemic of racist violence in particular, which pervades society throughout. It's part of our economy. The uh, economic disparities have real violent consequences, whether in our economy, in our school system, uh, in the mass incarceration that has massively incarcerated disproportionately people of color. We need to end the racist war on drugs and treat drug problems as a health problem, not a criminal problem. And we need to ensure that there are investigators available to every community. So in order to find out what happened uh, in the case of a death uh, in police custody or, or in our jail system, we need to be able to investigate. Every victim and every family is really owed an explanation. So we need to have independent investigators which are available to do that. So. The bottom line is we can have an America and a world that works for all of us, that puts people, planet, and peace over profit. Right now we got a system that's putting profit over everything else. We need to be putting us, the planet, and our future over these profiteering systems. And we have the power to do that. We have the numbers, we have the vision and the values. 76% of the American public is clamoring for an open debate. And by the way, I will be there at the steps of Hastra, and I really encourage you to come out and join me, and let's stand up for the democracy we must have. We are in crisis mode right now. Whether you look at the climate meltdown or the meltdown of our economy, the imprisonment of an entire generation locked into unpayable student debt, whether you look at the endless wars, the nuclear arms race, 2,000 nuclear missiles on hair trigger alert right now. Uh, this, is, this is madness. We need to be dismantling our nuclear weapons and moving towards nuclear disarmament in our time as soon as possible. These issues will not even be discussed. They will not come up unless we are in the debates. We need democracy if we're going to get out of the fix that we're in. Democracy is what we need in order to save us, and democracy needs to begin with an open and inclusive debate. So join us. Go to jill2016.com if you haven't already, and get on the campaign for open debates, and we will let you know. If you get to New York City, 
we'll have buses going to Hofstra arranged. So you can find out how to do it or carpool or get a bus. But join us when we stand up for democracy. And at the end of the day, we do have the power uh, to say no to the lesser evil and to fight for the greater good like our lives depend on it. The power to do that is not just in our hopes, not just in our dreams. It's right here at Rutgers. It's in our hands. Thank you so very much.